And hi everyone, I'm Carlton Duck, and so good to be with you today on Ask Me Anything. And I pray that your heart is going to be blessed with the topics that we have. We've just been bombarded with a lot of questions. That we're going to try to work through as many of them as we can today. But we appreciate if you would like to send a question and uh, like us to address it in our Wednesday night Bible time that we're doing every Wednesday uh, on our Facebook page, a part of the ministry of Gethsemane Baptist Church, then we would encourage you to do so. And you can just send it. You can message me or you can send it to my email or you can send it as a uh, as an attachment, or however you desire to send it, that would be fantastic. We would love to have you uh, share information with us so that we can uh, answer those questions and be a blessing to you. Of course, you can text those questions also. So I, I trust that it will uh, be a, a great blessing to you today. And again, welcome along to the program. I'm Carlton Duck, pastor of Gethsemane Baptist Church, and it sure is a blessing to be with you today, and I pray that uh, your heart is going to be greatly blessed of the Lord. Well, we're going to jump right in, but before we do that, I do want to remind you that uh, we'd love to have you to be a part of this ministry. Every Sunday, we'll, of course, during this pandemic, we're meeting with different hours, and uh, that's at 9.30 and 11.30 on Sunday morning, and uh, we have a great one-hour service, about an hour maybe a couple minutes more, just depends how long winded the preacher is. And uh, we have, oh, just inspiring and great music. Also, uh, a message from God's Word that I pray will bless you. That's this coming Sunday, every Sunday, here at Gethsemane Baptist Church. We also have a great program for our children. No, we don't have any children's church going on right now, Sunday school or youth ministries or whatever. But we do have a great program for our kids every Sunday, and it's called the Kitty Care Kit. And what they receive, they receive a, a nice lesson in the Bible, some information, a little treat, some other things of interest to them. And they just absolutely So bring your kids along. They are doing great uh, in the service. And we really appreciate uh, you bringing your family and being a part of the ministry of GBC and what God is doing here. Our location, 411 Blue Ridge Street here in beautiful Lynchburg, Virginia. Not hard to find, one block off of Lakeside Drive, we're near the main entrance to what used to be Lynchburg College, now, of course, the University of Lynchburg. So come out, join in the celebration this Sunday, bring your family, and let's have a good time in God's house. Well, today, let's get into some questions. And question number one, oh boy, this is a good one. A good question, too. All these questions are good. You know, we want to encourage you to send those questions because we want to enlighten you and encourage you in the Bible. So, Here's question number one. Is it all right for a woman to be an evangelist? And I would add to this question also to include being a pastor too. Now, that's probably a very hot debated issue within the church today. And, uh, and it's concerning a woman being an evangelist or being a pastor uh, of, a, of a ministry. So as a result, then I think it's very important today not to see this as an issue of man or men versus women. That's, this is not what this is about today. As a result, we understand there are women who believe that women should not uh, serve as pastors or evangelists. Of course, uh, there are those who believe they should, and uh, we're not here condemning or judging or doing anything of that caliber. I'm just bringing you or trying to show you what the Word of God has to say. But realizing this today, uh, this is not an issue on chauvinism. Uh, it's not an issue of discrimination. Uh, it's an issue of a biblical interpretation and looking at what God's Word says. Now, I think it's important to understand that I, I have found that God's Word is very explicitly clear. And uh, if we will just search it out and research and what God's trying to tell us, we will find that it is a great encouragement to our hearts and our lives. So the Word of God proclaims, let the women learn to be silent uh, with all subjection. So, uh, further, the Word of God says, this is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, But I suffer you not a woman to teach, nor to worship authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, realizing this today in the church, God assigns different roles to men and women. And we have to discern those roles as God's Word and God's will dictates today. This is a result of the way mankind was created, and you go way back into which this, when sin entered into the world, 
God, through the Apostle Paul, restricts women from serving in roles of teaching or having spiritual authority over man or men. Yet another objection to this interpretation we find of women in pastoral ministry uh, is in relation today to women who have held positions of leadership in the Bible, specifically Miriam, Deborah, uh, in the Old Testament. Now, it is true that these women, uh, they were chosen by God. There's no doubt about that. And they were chosen for a special service that God had them to accomplish and that would glorify him. And, of course, they would stand as what we would call models of faith today, of courage, and, yes, even in somewhat of a form of leadership. However, the authority of a woman in the Old Testament is not relevant to the issue of a pastor of a church. So the New Testament epistles, many written by Paul, presents a new uh, a new look or a new revelation as far as for God's people, the church and the body of Christ, we understand, and this involves an authority structure today, unique in the church, not for the nation of Israel or uh, any old other new Old Testament uh, entity. It has a New Testament application because we are a New Testament church. So that being the case, similar arguments are made uh, using Priscilla and Phoebe in the New Testament, that's found in Acts chapter 18, and Priscilla and Aquila are presented as faithful ministers in Christ. Now, Priscilla's name is mentioned first, of course, and perhaps indicating that she was more prominent in ministry uh, than her husband. Did Priscilla and her husband then uh, teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to Apollos? Yes, but they did that in their home, and they explain to him the, the way of God, God's way more adequately. You can find that in Acts 18 in verse 26. I'm giving you scripture now to support what I'm saying. Does the Bible ever say that Priscilla pastored a church or taught publicly or became the spiritual leader of a congregation? I can tell you emphatically, no, it doesn't. It does not say that. But the structure of 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 11 through 14 makes the reason why women cannot be pastors perfectly clear. Verses 13 begins with forgiving the cause of Paul's statement in verses 11 and through 12. So why should women not teach or have authority over men? That's a question. Because Adam was created first. We know the creative acts of God. And Adam was created. And then, of course, Eve and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived. You can check that out in verses 13 through 14. So God created Adam first. We know that because the word of God gives us evidence of that. And then he created Eve to be a helper. I believe the word of God uses like help meet, but uh, interpreta interpretation is that she was a helper to Adam. So the order of creation was universal in the family. God always has order. God always has a direction. We must follow that direction. Uh, you can look at Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 23, and uh, you can see evidence of that. And in the church. So the fact that Eve was deceived is also given today in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14 as a reason for women not serving as pastors or having spiritual authority over men. So this does not mean that women are gullible and that they are uh, more easily deceived than men. Uh, I respect women. I tell you, uh, I think women have a lot of discernment and a lot of wisdom, and we need to, we need to, of course, listen to them, and we need to gain knowledge and understanding from them. I think it's fantastic what God has provided through women. But if, if all women are more easily deceived, why would they be allowed then to teach children? You, you see, the fact of the matter is, the text simply says that women are not to teach men or have spiritual authority over men because Eve was deceived. So God has chosen to give men the primary function of teaching authority in the church. Many women excel in gifts of hospitality and uh, mercy and teaching and, and, and helping and serving. There's just a plethora of things that God uses a woman for. But much of the ministry in the local church, of course, we realize depends upon women and we're very thankful for the women in the local New Testament church. God has ordained that only men, though, are to serve in the position of spiritual teaching authority in the church. So 
This is not because men are necessarily better than women or better teachers or because women are inferior. It's just the fact today, it's simply the way God designed it. And we must follow God's direction today for the function. Men are set as an example in, in spiritual leadership in their lives, and that is through their words. So women are to take a less authoritative role today. Women are encouraged to teach other women, and I think that is a grand thing that happens. And, of course, they teach in Sunday school classrooms and things of that caliber. But you realize they, they're not restricted from that point. But the, the only activity women are restricted from is teaching or having spiritual authority over men. So, again, this is not a chauvinistic issue. It's not a discrimination issue. It's how God... See, you just can't take one thing and spin off with it. You, you've got to look at the application, research it, and, and see exactly what God is trying to tell us in these issues today. So rather, you know, than uh, looking at it from that point of, you know, women are, are not as good as men, that's not the issue here. It's the plan that God has for our lives, and we have to follow that plan. Not only that follow that plan as far as in this teaching, uh, of men, women, who's in leadership, who's in authority. But also, you've got to follow God's will for your life in everything that you do. And if you're not following God's will, then you're missing His will, and therefore you're not living in His will, and therefore you're living outside His will, and therefore then you're living in sin. And so, I'm glad today that if we will go to God's Word, we can find today exactly what God says about these issues, and we can see clearly through the lens of the Word of God exactly how we ought to live our lives and do what God's called us to do. That was the first question. Here's another good question for you today. This is a very good question. I've been asked this one before. Will there be animals in heaven? <laughs> well, let's look at that for a moment today. God has a, a special reason on place for each of his created beings today. Animals, too, have a purpose in God's creation. I have a little dog, and I'm telling you what, squirt is something else. And many of you... I've heard some of my stories about Squirt, and I've been bitten about seven times by him, and you would have thought I had learned after the first time. But uh, anyway, he's gotten better. I'm glad to tell you that. But uh, he's a part of my life, and I'm very thankful to the Lord for him because he's always waiting for me when I get home, and it's always a joy to see uh, a little uh, bark on his uh, face and a little smile, if you would, if, if dogs smile. But it's just good, you know to be blessed and, and have animals in our lives. Man, as the highest order of creation, let's get back to what we're talking about here, has been given dominion over the animal kingdom. Now, you can look at Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and you can find evidence of that. So we believe that animals were intended for man's enjoyment and use. And I know we get attached to our animals, and I know they become a very vital part of our life. So, therefore, the Bible itself does not indicate that there's life after death for animals. Now, don't get mad at me for saying that. It's just the fact there's nothing in there that indicates that. It may be that God's purpose for animals is fulfilled on earth. And we ought to thank God for that. Our purpose in going to heaven is not to go with our dog or cat or our pets. Our purpose in going to heaven is to glorify God and to see him face to face and behold his glory and to be with him for an eternity. However, if animals wouldn't make it, make us happy in heaven, surely there would be a place for them there, but I'm not really sure that that is needful or necessary or in, in, in pertinent here from that standpoint. I, I think the fact that we've got to look at is what's the purpose, and I think most of that enjoyment that comes to us is in this earthly capacity. So some Bible interpreters have called attention to Isaiah's description of the peace of God's future kingdom where he says that the wolf and the lamb would feed together and the lion would eat straw like the ox, and that's in Isaiah 65, 25. Heaven will lack nothing. Let's just, let's surmise this in this way. Heaven will lack nothing that is good. Everything in heaven is there for the purpose of bringing glory to God. And so our primary purpose is to bring glory to God now. And our purpose when we get there is to see him and behold his glory and to give him praise and honor there also. So your life is about glorifying God. Listen, friend, your life is not here about trying to get everything you can get, make all the money you can make, and all the other things that people are pursuant of. We are here to glorify and exalt our living God. And after salvation, we receive him 
as that personal Savior, then our life every day should be honoring Him, glorifying Him, exalting Him, and praising Him that He indeed is uplifted in our living every day. That was a good question. We're having a good time, aren't we? Also, there's another question. This is a very good question that I think uh, comes to the heart and the mind of many Christians. Will we recognize our loved ones who have gone before us, and will they know us? Now, that's a good question, and let's see today some implication here that we can gain from this. The implication of Scripture is that we will know our loved ones in heaven, both before and after resurrection. Now, understand something. Now, the Bible talks about there's no giving in marriage uh, in heaven. Uh, we will not be sure we will recognize one another, but your wife or your husband will not be your wife or your husband in heaven. We're not going there to pick up where we left off on earth. Uh, again, and I keep going back to this point, what is our purpose in going to heaven is to glorify God. And we should thank God that he has prepared a place for us and that one day he's coming for us and one day we're going to, yes, and you know, live in a mansion. And Jesus talks about that in John 14. But our purpose in going to heaven is not to occupy a mansion and not to walk on a street of gold and not to see walls of diamonds and, and not to just see the gates of pearl. Our purpose in going to heaven is to glorify God. But we'll be there with all those who have gone before us. We're not going there to recall all the bad experiences of this life that we went through. Those things, I believe, won't even be a memory there. What we're going to be doing is enjoying the presence of God and praising Him forevermore. And that's what really is exciting for us today. The disciples were, were able to recognize the Lord after His death and resurrection, if you'll recall that from the Scriptures. And, and through though sometimes that they didn't recognize Him because... Uh, two, well, two disciples didn't recognize him on the Emmaus Road. And the ability to disguise himself seemed to be phenomenal uh, from the standpoint of phenomenon uh, of his glorified body. Uh, Luke 24, you can read about that. Normally, however, they were able to recognize who he was. Now, Scripture teaches us that, that we will have a glorified body like his. Philippians uh, chapter 3 and verse 21, you can check that out, which suggests today that that which was true of his body will be true of ours. We will receive a glorified body. Further, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, was written to believers, some of whom had lost a, a, beloved, a beloved loved one, and realizing that that day when Christ comes back in what is called the rapture, that uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in there, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a great day that will be. So that's encouraging to our hearts. And so they were concerned about how death would affect those believing loved ones who had died before the Lord had returned in person. So at, at the point of death, you know, some believe in soul sleep. That's, that's scripturally wrong. Um, that does not agree with the word. That when your body to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, Paul said. So at the point of death... Uh, soul, our spirit goes to be with the Lord. Our body is placed in a grave or cremated or however the disposition may be. But in Paul's answer to this, he gave revelation that several of concerning several things. One, the rapture of the living saints and the resurrection of the believers who have died. But he also speaks of a reunion, not only with the Lord, but with believers that one day there will be a great reunion in heaven as a word of comfort that certainly can speak not only to the fact of the rapture and also the fact of the resurrection, but also of a reunion, which would mean little if we could not recognize our friends and our loved ones who have gone on before us. So, in addition, the Bible speaks of death and the rapture's being at home. And that's a quote-unquote. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, uh, John 14. And this would imply recognizing our loved ones. Yes, I believe that we will recognize our loved ones when we get to heaven. And what a great day of rejoicing that will be. And I believe in the hours in which we're living, in the conditions in which we're living in, and what things are pointing to. I believe we're not far from that home going and that homecoming that we're going to be with the Lord. Well, time's flying by, and I would like to cover a few more questions if we can. If we run a little bit over, that's all right, too. Here's another question. Do we have guardian angels? Now, that is a really good question. Thank you for that. The answer, Matthew 18 and 10 states, Take heed that ye despise 
not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their, their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. So in the context, these little ones, quote unquote, could either apply to those who believe in him, verse 6, or it could refer to little children, verses 3 through 5. So this is a key passage today regarding guardian angels. There's no doubt that, that good angels help to protect and you can look at some scripture like in Daniel 6, uh, 2 Kings, I've jotted these down, 2 Kings chapter 6, reveal information, Acts 7 um, and, and Luke 1, they talk about uh, the fact of revealing information, and then there's the guide that's uh, given to us in Matthew 1 and Acts 8, and then provide for the things that angels do, Genesis 21, 1 Kings 19, and also that they minister to believers in general, that's in Hebrews 1 and 14. So the question is whether each person, whether each believer has an angel assigned to that, to that person. So in the Old Testament, the, the nation of Israel had an archangel by the name of Michael who was assigned to it, Daniel 10. You can read about that. But scripture nowhere states that an angel is assigned to an individual. Angels were sometimes sent to individuals, but there's no mention of a permanent assignment that that angel is watching over you or there's a quote-unquote guardian angel. So the Jews fully developed the belief in guardian angels during the time when the Old and the New Testament uh, period. So some early church fathers believed that, that each person had not only a good angel assigned to him or her, but demons as well. <laughs> The belief in guardian angels has been around for a long time, but there's no explicit scriptural uh, basis for that. You've heard people talk about, well, uh, I got an angel on one shoulder and I got a demon on the other shoulder. Now, wait a minute. You've got Jesus in your heart. You may feel demon oppression, but you cannot be possessed once you're born again by Satan. And so, therefore, looking at this, the fact is today, we may be in warfare, and that's why we're told in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God, that we can fight against these evils of the world, but these angels are pictured as always watching, in the, watching the face of God as to hear the command to them to help a believer in a particular need. So the angel in this passage do not seem to be guarding a person so much as being attentive to their Father in heaven. You've got the Holy Spirit living within you. Greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. So then why do you really need, why do you need a guardian angel? God can be everywhere at all times and that he is because he's omnipresent. But realize it, it, it cannot be emphatically answered from Scripture whether or not believers have a guardian angel assigned to, to them. But as stated earlier, God does use angels in ministering to us. And I think that's the key word today. It is it's scriptural to say that he uses them as he uses us. That is, he, he in no way needs us, uh, needs them to accomplish his purpose. God is independent. He's self-sufficient. So if we have an omniscient, omnipotent, and loving God today, really, does it really matter that we have to have an angel, a guardian angel watching over us? I don't think so. I think today when we got the Lord, he's all we need. Praise the, praise the Lord. Here's another question. When will the rapture, when will the rapture occur? Oh my. When will the rapture occur? Some people think we are in the middle of the tribulation now. Wrong. The rapture has not occurred. And we're not in the tribulation. And we've already dealt with that issue last week. But let's talk about this. The rapture is an end time event where Jesus Christ returns for his church. He's the church, the believers, you and I, who are born again, we are the church. And according to scripture, the event will be instantaneous because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that we will be changed in the moment and the twinkling quicker than the snap of my finger of an eye. So the timing of the rapture is highly debated. Many wonder if it will occur before, during, or after the tribulation period. Well, as we talked about last week, the church is not going through the tribulation. Now, we may have trouble sometimes, as we're having right now. We may be going through some tough waters, as we're going right now. But let me tell you what, this is not the tribulation. We, the tribulation is a horrible time of, of seven years of, 
a set of three seven judgments that's poured out. And we're not in the tribulation. Let me tell you, folks, you better make sure you're saved and you know Christ is your personal Savior. You, it's important not only now, but it's going to be important when Christ comes because you're not going if you're not saved. And also the fact is that the church, Paul said, will escape the wrath which is to come. So while many end-time theorists today try to determine when the event will occur and point to, to clues or indicators, uh, the Bible is one thing today. The Bible is Scripture. The Bible is God's spoken, inert, infallible, inspired word. And today we can't calculate the date because the Bible says no man knoweth the hour nor the day when Jesus will come. So we should avoid determining a date and a time. I know people have done this, and, and it's wrong. It's, it's an error of the Scriptures, despite many attempts throughout all the years to calculate the date, the time, and all these other things. You cannot calculate the day when Christ returns. i tell you what you need to do. When Jesus was asked about the apocalyptic time by the apostles, he replied, It's not for you to know times or seasons, he said which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Acts 1, 7 through 8. So therefore today, the only God knows the date, the time, the hour in which God will send his Son to call his church out. I'm just glad I'm going to be going. How about you? So while Scripture nowhere encourages us to try to determine dates and times and, and things of that nature, because we do not know when Christ shall come. Now we're given indicators to watch for in last days. Read Matthew 24, 25. But also today it's important that we pay attention to the Bible's prophetic messages. That's what I'm telling you. And study God's word for the plan of the future that God has for us. So though we don't know the day, the time, I tell you one thing we better know. We better know that we're ready. We better know that we're prepared. We better know that we know Christ as our personal Savior. We better know for sure that we're going when he calls and when he comes. So therefore today, no, we do not know when the rapture will occur. We do know it will occur. We do know Jesus will come. We do know that we better be ready. So my encouragement for you today is what Amos said, prepare to meet your God. You don't know when you'll face the Lord, whether in death or whether in rapture. And that's the two ways you'll face him. And folks die every day that are in Christ. Well, instantly they're taken to the presence of the Lord. But you don't know when Christ shall come. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. One more question. And I'm going to try to squeeze this one in. We're kind of at that moment, but I'm going to go over a little bit. Do you mind? I hope not. <laughs> Hang in there with me. Question. Romans 14, 2. Vegan or carnivore, literal or allegory, was this relating to meat generally or meat offered to idols? Really good in-depth question. So first, let's read Romans 14 too, but I'm also going to throw in verse 3 because that has application also. He says, for one believeth that he may eat all things, uh, uh, eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Verse 3, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let him, uh, and let him, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Now, to eat meat or not to eat meat, that was the question many Christians, they struggled with this, um, with it in the first century, with the first century church. It, it was such a controversy that Paul he spent a whole chapter in the book of Romans. Now, understand, Paul's writing to the church. We've been in the book of Romans since last, not, we've been in the book of Romans in, in each Sunday uh, since April 2019. So, realizing this, he wrote a whole chapter in the book of Romans addressing what may seem as a trivial question, but is very pertinent and very important. So, Romans 14 it has a very complex argument, or segment, I should say, of Scripture that frequently has been misunderstood and abused and probably in reality has been ignored and just read over and not paid any attention to. We're not going to read over it. We're going to go through it. And so it, it confronts a variety of issues. The text arises out of the transitional era of what we know as religion, religional or religious history when many 
converts to Christ were passing from one great divine system, which was the Mosaic regime, and to another which we know as the Christian age. Because of the diverse backgrounds, religious and cultural, being a part of both Jews and Gentiles, many problems then arose that threatened the unity in the body of Christ. So because of time, we can't read or relate the entire chapter. But let me encourage you here in a few weeks that uh, in this study, we're in chapter 12 right now, and here in a few weeks, we will be actually going through verse by verse uh, in chapter 14. So I'm just going to give you a summary of this, and you can, be, uh, you can tune in, or I hope you'll come to church. Uh, you can, in whatever capacity, you can catch us on Facebook with the service, or you can, of course, attend church, and you can get it. Uh, in the service. But the fact of the matter is, we're going to deal with this in, in the upcoming weeks also in church. But in a larger context of this address, the Apostle Paul, he really contrasts those who are weak, that's Romans 14 and verse 1, with those who are strong, if you'll look over in Romans 15 and verse 1. So a careful consideration of the relevant data that we see that leads to the conclusion that the stronger are those who have a greater degree of Christian faith, a, cl a closer walk with God. Romans 14, 1 through 2, and of course Romans uh, 14 and verses 22 through 23. The stronger faith was characterized by a more precise, a more precise understanding of, of Christian doctrine. You can look at Romans 10 and 17 and get a better uh, definitive look at that. The stronger, which... Stronger mean more knowledgeable in the faith, for an example, uh, perceives that certain meats, formerly unclean under the Mosaic uh, economy, going back to Leviticus chapter 11, are no longer forbidden to those who are in Christ. So these saints understand that certain days, formerly esteemed as holy, quote unquote, henceforth are not to be viewed as such under the law of Christ. Now, the strong Christians must exercise patience as to understand that the weak have not reached the level of knowledge that is possessed by the more mature who are in Christ. Romans, again, Romans 14, 2 through 3. So you have people at different levels of their knowledge and understanding of God's word. God wants us all to understand his word. That's why Paul, writing to Timothy, said, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not but to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. You can know the truth of God's word, but you need to be in the word. The word needs to be in you, because when you meditate on the word, uh, Paul, or rather David, wrote about that in, in uh, Psalm 1, that you know, if we will meditate on God's word, we'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and our leaf will not wither, and whatsoever we do shall prosper. We're gaining knowledge. We know more about God. We know more about His Word. We have a better understanding of Him and what He's doing in our lives. So realizing that, therefore, the strong must extend, uh, we must extend the compassion and long-suffering, allowing the weak time to, to grow, thus reaching a level of comprehension, understanding, wherein they can move forward in their Christian life. We don't, we don't, demean people because they maybe are not at the level where we are or maybe we're not at the level where they are. But understand we are to lift up, to encourage. That's an important part of the church that we encourage one another, that we lift up one another. So unity, here it comes. What we need is unity among Christians today. We need to be unified in Christ. We need to be encouraging one another, lifting up one another, and, and really being a part of someone's life mentoring people. It's important. So Paul strongly admonishes the brethren to be united in matters that do not affect the integrity of the that do not affect the integrity of the Christian faith, uh, the eating of certain foods or the honor of honoring of particular days. I mean, they are minor issues. The individual asking the question stated the whole chapter is dedicated to this. So Paul was teaching a lesson that goes beyond being a vegan or avoiding upsetting someone. Yes. So that is, that is correct. And, and if you will follow my series on Sunday morning in Romans, you're going to see how we're appropriating God's word, and especially in Romans 14, and we will give you more details. So let me, let me surmise. Let me sift 
<laughs> Let me sift all this down for you and, and, and give you the final analysis here. May God help each of us today to inhale the fragrant vapors that come forth out of Romans 14. It's not a chapter to be ignored. It's a chapter to be studied and to be revealed in our lives, to digest the principles of this tremendously magnificent narrative, thus willing today to digest and to diverse uh, ourselves into a, uh, not into these inclinations of, of, of self-interest, not, not to be pushing ourselves into these things, but for the ultimate goal of a large population in heaven. That's what we're here to do, is to draw men and women to Christ and to uplift, to encourage, and to show them Jesus. So the motto of the Christian should be compassion without compromise. And I'm going to close with that today. Compassion without compromise. And we need that. We've got too many compromising the Word of God. Let's not key on the minor issues. Let's not strain a net here. Let's not, you know judge or criticize what somebody else is doing we are in for a purpose and a cause and we are here to to propagate or to proclaim the message of jesus christ and you do that through your living through the example of your life it's one thing what you say it's another thing what you live friend listen it's important in these days that the church the born-again believers are living for Christ and segregated to the point today that we are con containing the Word of God in our life, and that is first and foremost, and that is what we need. We need today to be set apart, to come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Be distinctive, be different, be zealous, be full of the Spirit of God. Live for the Lord. Be the person that God's called you to be, and then watch God mightily work in your life. Thank you today for tuning in. Ask me anything, and you can. And I'll do my dead level best to answer to you from the scriptures of God's word. I'm Carlton Duck, pastor of Gethsemane Baptist Church. Please come and see us this Sunday, either at 930 or at 1130, 411 Blue Ridge Street in Lynchburg, Virginia. I'm going to be looking for you, and may God mightily encourage and bless your heart. Thank you for tuning in today.